Yeah, welcome everybody. Um, very, very excited to be having this a uh, conversation uh, with uh, with you guys. Um, this is actually a topic that uh, it's very close to my heart um, because I've always been the sort of recruiter when back in my recruiting days. I've always been the zero to 50 type person, you know, working for a small organization, maybe the solo recruiter in. Um, so the challenges that we've been talking about in this series uh, with Tripad are actually really close to the, to home for me. Um, and today's topic is going to be talking about do SMB, small, medium sized businesses, do they have some sort of advantage when it comes to employer branding and talent attraction? And maybe the bigger companies don't have. Um, it's a, it's kind of counterintuitive when you think about it, um, because those big brands, those, uh, you know, well-known B2C organizations, they oftentimes do not struggle um, to attract candidates. Um, if you look at graduate recruitment schemes and, you know, ask the Gen Z who are the top employers that they want to work for, guess what? It's all the big name brands that everyone's heard of. And typically they're tools that we use today. Um, the name recognition really carries it over uh, for them. And so they don't actually have the same problem of attracting candidates. Their problem is actually filtration, candidate experience, candidate assessment, and so on. Um, now, if you're like a small business, you're starting out, or perhaps you're just a normal sized company that doesn't grow in hyper scale, it could be that you've got these challenges also. How do you build a brand that is attractive to the audience you want to recruit for when you're going to be outcompeted by all of these other big, big organizations. That is the topic of the day, folks. Uh, what is the me mechanism to build an effective talent, uh, sort of employer branding uh, uh, function uh, for an SMB? Um, all right, folks, I just want to make sure everyone can hear me okay. Um, uh, let me know uh, in the chat. I think you're on Zoom, folks. So I think there's two ways in which you might be watching this. Um, you could be watching this on Zoom. Um, and you could be watching this on LinkedIn Live. We're able to chat to you in both sides. So um, let us know uh, if you can hear us okay. I think you should be, have access to the chat. Uh, nice to see you there, Ed. Fantastic stuff. Um, and make use of the chat, by the way, folks. We want to hear from you. We want to hear your voice and what your opinions are. Um, you also have a Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. Uh, so make use of that if there are specific questions that you want to have the crowd or other panelists answer. Um, so before we kick off, let's just introduce our wonderful panelists. Um, I, let's go uh, sort of uh, clockwise as I see it from my screen. Gianluca, why don't you introduce yourself? Who are you, what it is you do? Yeah, super, thank you, Hank, and super excited to, to be here sharing some experiences that we all have had in, in, our, in our lives. Uh, my name is Gianluca. I'm a, an, an expert in talent acquisition, having had the opportunity to work in, in successful startups uh, such as Globo, that I think I got many interesting examples from there. Uh, companies as Booking.com, blockchain technologies, and, and nowadays a little bit with AI and remote. But yeah, super happy to be here. Fantastic stuff, Shanluka. Um, and we have Imran Sharif here as well. Imran, wonderful to see you. Um, can you quickly introduce yourself? Who are you? What it is you do? Hi, uh, so my name is Imran. I'm, I'm the group people manager for Trophy. Um, I was invited by Haley, or is it from Tripat? Um, so just very excited to be here. I'm really liking to look after the HR and the whole model stuff, really. Fantastic stuff, Imran. And and uh, last but not least, we have Christina here as well. Christina, do you want to introduce yourself? Who are you? What it is you do? Yeah, so um, I'm Christina Robinson. I run um, a marketing agency that works with recruiters, recruitment agencies more specifically, in terms of putting their brands together, using social media to get out there, reach candidates, and keep their candidate pool, just keep it churning, keep those those ideal candidates popping up so they can make those placements. I've been doing that since 2013. Fantastic stuff. Okay, so help me out. I am an, a, a one person uh, a recruiter into this company's just hired their first recruiter. It's me. I've walked in there. They've got no EB, they've got no talent strategy, they've got nothing. But actually, they're not a very well known brand either. Maybe they're not a B2C to, B to brand. They're, they do like really some weird B2B B type of activity. Is there any point? 
in me doing employer branding or is this just going to be a job where I'm going to be sourcing? I mean, there's the, you know, there's no other way in which uh, any advertising or any campaign is going to bring uh, talent in. Uh, Christina, I might as well start with you from your consultancy side. Uh, have you encountered any organizations that are in that uh, type of scenario? Yeah, all day, every day. Absolutely. And I think employer brand is very much like personal brand. The moment your organization is born, you have an employer brand. Whether or not you've chosen to leverage it is the question. You know, it is a if we put if we put nothing out there in terms of our the values that we have, the culture that we have, if there is nothing reflecting that, then actually your employer brand says that there's not, you know, you're not an interesting in organization to be involved in. So I think we have to accept that using using that employer brand. It's not, I'm going to start one. It's more a case of, am I leveraging it? What does it already look like? All right. That's a really good insight straight away. So you have an employer brand, irrespective of whether you're conscious of it. <laughs> like you might be walking around with like no true idea or even you might not even respect the concept. Um, however, employer brand is how other people who are not employed by you perceive you as an employer. So you can't walk around and say you don't have one because guess what? Um, you have candidates that go through your process and say no to your job or they decide not to apply to your job. That's because your employer brand ain't speaking to them. And if you're not putting anything out there, then I think you're right. It does communicate something. It's kind of like having a, 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 a very sparse LinkedIn profile, isn't it? Um, I mean, not to say that's a bad thing um, because, you know, everyone's got different times to do whatever. But sometimes you end up being a little bit suspicious to say, look, this dude literally has not cared whatsoever about how he's describing himself professionally. You know, maybe he's not a great salesperson per se. I would say, yeah, I'd, I'd have doubts about a salesperson that didn't have a LinkedIn profile. Like what, what the heck's the story there? Um, okay, let's go to you, Imran, on this. You're working, I understand, for a, uh, uh, for a company that perhaps, you know, uh, organizations people don't mind have heard of. You're starting up as a new business, a new brand, so to say. Um, what, what are the initial ways in which you understand your current employer brand status let's accept there is an employer brand because people might have that assumption how how is there a way in which you find out how people think about your business or do you have to just screw it we're gonna forget what they say now and you know just, this, this is how it is no no no. i'm just echoing christina's on that but it's very very important that how what who you work for right and then it comes to the second phrase like and how you can really really approach your brand to the different people like you said like okay you want to employ somebody they never heard of you they'll be like hang on what am i going to work what exactly i'm going to get into there's a very very important that you employ a brand that's out there and there's a quite a lot of way you can really like you know the um like explore or like you know the expand your employer branding to the different people or the different parts like for for, in, for instance i myself do a lot of community work I got a lot of like, you know, the, uh, like, for example, I work with the reading partners. I was the other day with a conference call with the almost 350 people that I represent my trophy brand, right? So then start looking, a lot of people, they didn't know like, and who am I work for? And then I start looking into the brand. Okay, and I start getting to know it. And then how we can really do the different ways, for example, um, LinkedIn. Just go ahead, do whatever you want to do, like, you know, with your brand, what you do, even little things, doesn't matter really, like, you know, how you do it. So that's something like, you know, that's very important for me because I do present the employee branding. So that's what so one of the, like, you know, the key, like I do from my, for, for, for my organization. And for me, it's always, it's like important. Like anyone know that the restaurants group, why? Because they're the huge, their marketing is that expanding. And you know the grind. Why? Because they are just an absolutely phenomenal when they do the marketing and then their branding. And then how you do really brand? Because brand speak themselves when they are like an upfront a bit. So even a lot of like you know the chain companies they pay less than the old independent company, but they are more likely attract a lot more people onto their chain company just because their name there. So that's how it's really really important. Name it recognition is so important not in every decision we make. Um, and the more important the decision, the more relevant the name is. 
Um, like for instance, I just went on to Alibaba two two days ago. I randomly bought a bunch of stuff because I didn't care. The values of those items were really low. Uh, I just needed a commodity for that particular thing. Brands not really significant there. However, if I'm going to go buy a car, uh, you know, I'm not going to just randomly buy a car. I need to, what is it? There's certain brands already I know I'm going to buy and there's certain brands I know I'm not going to buy. It, sort of it, whether that is kind of uh, irrational or not, it doesn't matter. And by the way, same with software. Uh, if you're buying software for a business, I see it in my group all the time. People are asking, okay, what ATS should I buy? A Bun bunch of uh, people uh, volunteer the names. You know what? If your name is not being volunteered in that dialogue, you know that you're not going to get in. Um, so I think employers, uh, particularly if you're in a competitive space, um, you've got to handle that. So let's go to you, John Lucas, straight away. Um, nobody knows us. That's step one. Uh, like, how do we how do we get the name out? Like, uh, uh, let's assume we don't have unlimited budget. What are the cheaper ways in which I could get people to know who we are? That's a very good question. I will relate very to to uh, Christine and Imran as they they already said two key things that you already have a brand once you are born, and as well starting with the why. Also echoing a little bit to to Simon Sinek. So the first thing is starting with the why and getting uh, C level founders and everyone involved into what's your why, what's your mission, what's your purpose, uh, and seeing if that it's really happening inside. Because I will not sell. A, something that is not real outside, even though that, of course, we want to work into that. So first of all, I will work into, into the inside. What are we wanting to express outside and defining that clearly? Um, after that, uh, there are some things that you can do, but I will, I will also divide that in inbound, uh, inbound uh, the people that we want to attract, and as well, how we go to the people with our brands, because we will be doing all these things at the same time. But low budget things. Um, I don't know, e inbound, for example, um, careers page, try to express in your careers page uh, all your values, what are you doing, as Christine said, uh, uh, the, the, trying to express what you're doing, social media, social media, you can do it already, you can leverage AI, you can work in different ways, uh, of course, um, employees, uh, work with your employees, for example, at Global, we did in the past, uh, employee value week campaign. So each week we talk about a value and we got our own employees to talk about the values in different social media. So that's almost zero cost in the sense that you can do with an iPhone, uh, a good uh, maybe software and, and, and take it out there, right? Um, then uh, you can build as well a candidate persona uh, to start doing uh, inbound and attracting the specific people on targets that you want. Um, that's also simply targeting better um another thing for outbound for example we were starting to get candidates from yeah let, let me stop one second uh, jean, uh, jean luc uh, uh jean luc because we should yep. totally have a list of these things towards the end uh by the way uh, enable people to make notes um because i think this is so important as uh, some of the the ideas you're, you're spitting out um before we get into the weeds and this is my fault um i actually had charged externally classic marketing error charged externally before the key point and as you mentioned you have to actually do some internal work before you can go out and say this is who we are because how do you know who you are um every, you know are you just going to read up on the internet and just pluck out a bunch of popular cliches and say that's us maybe that isn't you you know have a look internally you, you in other words there is kind of a survey work you've got to do uh with your business um, to try and figure out what actually is the lived experience of the people that work in the company. And C-level is important, but I think it's also a mistake to stay purely at C-level because they may be away from the factory floor, man. Um, you know, they, they, they may actually be saying, yeah, of course we're like this. And, you know, and actually when you speak to the guys or the team and uh, who's doing the work, they're saying, What's he on about? <laughs> this is not my this is not my life. So you got to get in and talk to the folks. Um, what is the tooling that we use to do that? Um, is it as simple that you, we create a Google form or something? Um, or is there like a nice app that we can use? Like, how do we actually collect the information um, that's relevant for us to understand how our current employees think about their the, the company? 
Imran thoughts? Yeah, I mean, you can you can do this one. This is quite a few different ways. But so what what we do, we do have got like the Microsoft form. Obviously, we send out the surveys, and then we collect, and we do bi annually. So we do twice a year. So it's very important for us to know that the and employees need to be heard. That what exactly what we're doing for them because you got to understand that it's a two-way street, right? It's not only on the employers, it just comes from the employees. That's why it comes in, because employer is just sitting there, but the employees are the real, real people that drive the whole thing. So we just need to help God. So we do that way. And also have to have sort of um, go on site, have got like general discussion, sit down, have got sort of things. We also have got a break room. So then we can also like, you know, that sort of thing can get the bit of like, you know, the uh, outside of the work and you can understand them, what they think about the your brand, not only just you work, because what I work, I'm going to say only good things about it, right? That's the natural thing that comes up. But how about like, if come out of the comfort zone and say like, you know what, how do you feel about it? what exactly you enjoy most about? It? So that's how we can really, really collect those sort of things. But um, you can use also the, some external companies. They also have got the service like a cultural amp on that. Or you can just create your own service and then send out and then collect your own. I think let's go low five. We can't afford culture amp. Yeah, they haven't given any free free uh, sort of accounts to us. We have to go low fi um, okay. So it's going to be a, a survey, right? What questions need to go into that survey, guys? Do you want to just chuck a few, a few of them out there? Um, this is the first EV, EV this company's ever done. Um, what sort of questions should I be putting into a survey which I want everyone to complete? Gianluca? The first thing is, that again, with the why, why, uh, why uh, or what, uh, why do you like the most to work here? What is the, the, the things that you like the most about working here? And, of course, that vice versa, right? From the simple things after to the, to the more specifics. Yeah. What do you like about working here? Number one, uh, how uh, uh, Christina, give us another. I'd ask, what would you change? Love it. Absolutely love it. Um, yes, it's brilliant. But if you could do one thing that can improve this company, what would it be? Boom, man. That's like you pay you pay a management consultant thousands per day to come up with that intelligence. Uh, you know, if your CEO sitting there and you're getting a hundred of, of those recommendations coming in that you don't know because you know what you got loads of bosses in between you and the um, uh, the, the the staff, then boom, that's going to be amazing. Imran, give us a question you would put into that form. And what would you continue to doing so after the question? So, what currently works well that you want to persist with? So, in other words, if there's one thing we we don't want to take away from you. <laughs> because <laughs> you sometimes you can actually do accidentally do that like you can say oh you know it seems that our company wants us to do this this is the solution and then it's actually you you're removing a component um of someone's uh working day that actually might be very important to them and you know that you've not consulted them about that so three brilliant let's keep going this is a good exercise jean luca give us question four what other question goes into the first survey um, I was thinking something uh, around uh, what would you like to add? Because you already change, you already continue, but what will you add to something that is already working? Yeah, so what is the thing that would make a, an existing thing better, right? Um, I think similar to, to uh, uh, yeah, I think that's a great question. Uh, someone should be make, making notes. Um, okay, uh, Christina, uh, give us question five. Okay, so what jumps into my head, I'm going to give it you now, but it almost needs to be the last question. Okay. And it is what else? Because the thing is, when people are answering these questions, it's what's in their conscious mind, that's what they're answering with. And actually, if we want to get nitty gritty with this, if we want to get to that deeper level, asking the question, what else? Okay, so you love this about what you do. What else do you love about what you do? Yeah, I love it. So it's basically creating, it's that free text part end of the form, isn't it? Where you input a few things, that's brilliant. But what else do you want to tell us? Because uh, now's a good time. Because um, sometimes, I'm sure, it's just true for everybody, actually. We walk around working for companies, but we we don't, often don't find the, the time or place to actually escalate or to percolate that information upwards. You know, we end up just like parking in our minds saying, yeah, I'll... I'll I'll remember to have that one-to-one at -one the end of the week and I'll, I'll bring it up then. But obviously th the things happen and you forget about it. Um, so here's an opportunity to collect that information, 
company-wide intelligence stick it up okay Imran final question we've got six page form six question form what's the final question we're going to put into this form uh for uh, uh collecting the last one that was the what else that's the that's the end you can't ask for afterwards the the, the but, what else is number six we need number five from you or the number five yeah so you could you could ask like you know the uh would you um recommend your organization to your friends and family or colleagues yes so you're not asking necessarily for intelligence, but just get a sense Fantastic. as to whether there's employee really advocacy it already in the company. And by the way, we've got to be brave here, folks, uh, because we might we have to be prepared for answers that says, no, I won't. Um, and we can't penalize people for that. We actually have to create a very safe environment to say, we, if you don't feel you can recommend someone to the company, that that is important for us to know. And because this is the anonymous, so they can be they can be lying. So it's not really harms. Like what have I, I? I'm going to speak my mind regardless. Yeah, you have to make it. So there's another point. It has to be anonymous. You have to guarantee all of that security. But maybe if they can't recommend, it begs the question: Can you can you give us a re, the, the 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 major reason why you wouldn't? And by the way. This may feel as if it's setting back your EB project. If you're collecting feedback that is suboptimal, uh, you know, uh, negative rather than positive. However, what you're really doing is exposing some of the problems that were always going to be there, no matter how brilliant your EB polish is. You have to then, you've now identified areas that could be fixed. Like for instance, listen, you're always going to get a few people complaining. You're always going to get a few folks that are always malcontents. We, we understand that group. But if there is a pattern, two, three, five people start saying, you know what, I can't recommend because of this reason. It's kind of a similar reason. Then that's something that's, there's something that's worth addressing. Um, either you're recruiting the wrong people who don't want to, who can't uh, sort of uh, thrive in that environment and you've not been aware of it, which is why you've brought them in. Uh, or, the environment is, is 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 a problem there, um, which has caused different types of people to have the same issue. In which case, you got to fix it. Um, so, the survey exercise number one uh, thing to do. Okay, so I've, we've collected all the information. Um, I presume, uh, what do we write it up? I mean, what what's what, what's the next stage with all of this uh, survey data? So, what we normally do here is that then we collect this data. And then we call out the stakeholders and the directors and we share with those data, right? And then we exercise with the individual site. We go there and then we have discussed. And then they actually share that the whole like you know, service, that the percentage and how they feel about it. Because maybe from that side, 90% was the one question was just positive and one was negative. So then how you can eliminate that negative question that came out? How can you really change it? Because that's what the rectifying phrase that you come in. So that's how we do it. And you can only do it by sit down with a group of individuals and go like, you know, this location. Because if you don't do that, there's no point to do the service only. They will be like, you know, hang on, I'm just going to fill it up. but never going to, no one's going to come and ask me, how did I feel really about it? And why did I even fill up that form? So your survey, survey percentage is going to drop significantly if you don't do that. So that's very important. That's what we do to ensure like, you know, the, uh, they just follow up on that. And we're trying to like an implementation and that's what we do. Oh, okay, really, really important uh, step. So that it's very clear what the second step is. It isn't just go and write it up. You've actually got to recognize that people have contributed their effort and their input um, and you've got to publish it. You've got to say, Look, guys, here's, yeah. we've we'll finished our collection. This is what it looks like. Um, here are the some key uh, distribution or whatever. And by the way, this kind of lends itself to creating a, a fairly simple form. You don't want to have, you know, 50 questions or whatever. You want to have something that is producible really quickly. And then you can just uh, open that up to discussion. Um, and, you know, it, the discussion, uh, it sounds like you, you're going site to site, uh, Imran, which I totally get and I endorse that approach. But it could be you're working in a remote business or you could be working for one office business. The way I would play it, I don't know whether Gianluca or Christine will feel the same, is that you then suggest that here's, we're going to do some open town halls to discuss the, the feedback. And then just, if you're interested in participating, great, uh, attend these events. So you open it up to anybody who wants to attend that's it, uh, and be there, but you're not forcing it on every team or forcing it on every department. 
Um, because there's going to be some people who don't care. I mean, there's uh, there's going to be, I don't know what percentage is, 10%, 20% that, you know, that, that they're not into it. That's totally fine. That's they're doing what they're doing. Um, don't subject them to that, but open up a space so that they can enter it. Um, but it's on your schedule. And you could do that maybe a, a week after you've collected the data. Uh, so close the gap between collection and, and, and doing that wash up. Um, and that wash up is basically, you know, uh, to surface up some of these, these interesting insights. Like, why is it that, you know, why do you think that you know, 10% of the people said they wouldn't recommend? I mean, what are those things and get the qualitative information back? Um, Okay, so already this may be taking two weeks. How do we explain this to the boss, guys? I mean, I, I, this sounds exciting. Um, we, we, you know, I want to, I want to do it. Uh, but you know what? The EB, quote unquote, the output is actually quite far down the road. Suddenly, this looks like a three month project. Uh, I've got my boss saying, "Yeah, yeah, we, hung, come on, mate." Um, you know, the, <laughs> the plan is actually to recruit some candidates. Where are my candidates? How do we sell this story up upstairs to the boss? get the boss off our back and say, you know what, this is important. We have to go through this flow. Maybe trying to address the, the time to hire and the cost per hire in the future, uh, because we will raise the quality of hire with our, with our brand. I'm talking through the talent acquisition side. So of course, if the cost of operations per week if our, in our projects is X, and we can show them that uh, doing employer branding in three months is going to reduce the time to hire because we're going to get more quality applicants and, and so on. And of course, other parts of the business will be uh, benefited from that. Um, apart from productivity as well, for example, uh, we can track productivity in different areas. Uh, I think uh, what normally uh, leaders want to see is what benefit uh, it has to them. And I think of course, uh, reducing time to hire Quite, uh, increasing quality of hire and demonstrating that productivity can go up uh, via these initiatives could be key. I love that metric cost per operation, right? So in other words, uh, speak to your, to your um, uh, the business and say, look, how, 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 how much does it cost for, you know, this team to sit there and do their work? Oh, it costs this amount per worker. And you can say, okay, great. How much would it cost if that worker wasn't there? Um, how much would it actually cost the business if half the team wasn't there? Um, uh, great. Let's calculate that number. And then the argument is, look, we need to get the employer branding right because we want to be talking to the right candidate pool so that we're, we're, we're pipelining more relevant people rather than just more people. Um, because sometimes you can be super successful at talent attraction, quote unquote. I think here's the difference between talent attraction and EB. Talent attraction is just increasing the applicant flow. Um, but you know what? Uh, that's that may actually be increasing the workload for your recruiters, for your hiring managers, what have you, because you've got a flood of these candidates. A lot of them are not going to be on brand. They're not going to be relevant. Uh, they're not going to be interested per se. Do you have an attrition problem, for instance? Um, uh, oftentimes, uh, companies that have a very powerful talent attraction approach um, have a very bad, a very high attrition rate because uh, they haven't actually aligned their talent attraction uh, to, you know, the value system that we're talking about right now. So uh, values to get it right in order so you can you can get the right filter uh, when the candidates come through. Um, OK, very good. Um do we come up with a document at the end of the collection exercise? Is that basically like, do we want to create a document that is guys, this, or maybe an online uh, uh, wiki or something? I mean, what is the output of the data collection? Um, how does that look like? I'm presuming it doesn't stay in my head. Like I'm presuming it's, it, it has to be externalized into a, a document other people can scrutinize and, and pick up and use and so on. Is that right? Yeah, 100%. You collect this with all of this, and then you collect the data, and you save it. So you can always compare to like the light or any other things. But you know, so you have to have something like in the form of so you keep that one year on year. So I have, uh, I will sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. No, that I will suggest to as Imran said, and you said just collecting the data and then set an OKR with within the company uh, that it's maybe in every town hall every month or whatever where you track. You set an objective, so instead just of operations objectives and budget objectives and sales objectives, you put an internal uh, employee satisfaction or whatever it is uh, objective, and you track it all together as a company uh, with the data you collected at the beginning over the lapse of X number of time uh, publicly. 
Yeah, cool. Okay. Um, thank you, Vibia. I mean, I, I, I'm not sure whether audio is going to be okay for everyone, but essentially, uh, there may be if there's a way in which we could increase the pickup on our mics, that may help uh, uh, people who uh, are trying to listen in. Um, okay, but, good um, stuff. Um, sorry, I've got a slightly different angle on this, if you don't mind Please. sharing now. So, like, as you're going through this process, you know, so you, you've got those questions. We need to, the leaders in the business need to be constantly mindful of these questions and looking looking for the answers of the questions in their teams. When you do the town halls, you need to listen for the stories because the data is one thing. But if we want to get this employer brand out there, from a marketing perspective, this is where we need to be able to tell the stories of the people in our business. And honestly, in my experience, it is that the SMB businesses, this is much easier for. We, we naturally have more advocacy with our people because it is a tighter team. They are more willing to share stories honestly, openly. And actually that now goes out into our content, whether it is a blog on the website, a YouTube video, a LinkedIn update, whatever it is. Us being able to take this data and actually really communicate it out there, not just as a a PDF someone can download, but as something that is tangible, that allows people to create an emotional connection with our brand. It helps from an EB perspective, but also when you're trying to sell it into the higher ups, it ties in so wonderfully into the commercial offering of that brand that it actually sell, helps them sell more product. It helps them get more you know, people using their services whilst also people going like oh my god I'd, I'd i'd love to work with hug i'd like i want to be on that team with imran and i think this is it we we have to look for these stories and take that step and share them beyond the data no i like that i love that a lot and it's it the, the data is basically the substrate for the, the 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 stories to grow isn't it it gives you the confidence that the stories are real um, so yes, you do the data collection, the town hall, those interviews are super important. Uh, but uh, what I'm hearing from you, Christine, is that actually you can kind of dual task those town halls because you, you can use them as in intelligence to so learn, uh, what, what, what people are saying. Uh, but there's no reason why, uh, some of that learning couldn't be directly converted into content. Um, you know, if someone is advocating hard to listen, this is the reason why this company is amazing. Get that on camera, man. I mean, get that enthusiasm collected. Um, uh, no need to uh, uh, obviously get permission of people, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but almost, uh, you know, don't wait for a content production window, quote unquote, um, uh, before you actually start collecting this. You should almost like collect a lot of this stuff uh, by uh, by default. Okay. Uh, very good. Um, let's um, let's think about sort of the. Um, uh, uh, let's imagine we've we figured out sort of where we're at as a business. We know why some people like to work for us. We also know why some people don't like to work for us. Um, but we do also have a weak external brand in the sense we feel not enough people know us. Um, so maybe that's step one. How do we actually increase the brand presence of a SMB business? Um, what are the techniques that you think uh, might be useful or effective to to, to try? Uh, thoughts are here. I'll, I'll, I'll leave it uh, open to anybody who wants to uh, contribute. Um, I'm just going to go first. I think um, it's one of the things you should do, and it's a very cheapest way to do it, to work with the local community. That's a very, very easy way to get it out your mum out there. For example, you do the charity work. You're really not contributing, but again, you're raising the funds for them, and then we're being part of that, and your also name is there. Give an example we are working with the only payments away, right? And then we work with only payments away and they have got like hundreds of like, you know, the uh, hospitality institute work under them or with them. So when you go there, I know the banner is up. So your name is there as well, but you're participating in that. So that means that you're not really, you don't have any budget, but you're helping them at the same time your branding is up there. Same thing as well with the work with the local schools, right? You go there, do some volunteer work, like help the kids or pupils, whether they're CVs or something, and you have got that conference off, and you just basically stand up and just throw your name out. So those sort of work, you do that, it definitely can 
raise your brand awareness and also ex like and expand those to the people that don't know you. So it's one of the easiest way to do so. Right, really good uh, uh, insight, um, Imran. So there's activities you can perform on a pro bono basis um, that will get your name out there simply because a lot of the pro bono stuff is actually field based. So you can go ahead and do that. Um, but you could also be kind of strategic about it. I mean, uh, it could be that you decide to align with a particular campaign or align with a I know, locally prominent issue. I'm imagining all of the conditions that might make sense for you. Uh, a lot of it is going to be context specific, for instance. But let, I'm just imagining you're an SMB employer in a small regional town somewhere. You're just battling away with bigger brands and all the rest of it. Well, guess what? Maybe locally to where you're at, maybe perhaps you are a decent sized brand there. Um, is there stuff you can do to the lo with the local college? Uh, that can improve how people perceive you. Um, is there stuff you can do, uh, you know, whenever there's a local event, you know, get, get fully involved in the local community. Um, and I think that will elevate uh, what's going on there. Okay, uh, other thoughts. Uh, Jean-Luc, how do we sort of increase our brand uh, when we were a small business? I think more into the remote side of things. Uh, I'm working with a remote uh, company uh, now and fully remote. So th that's the the other side of the coin. I will follow a little bit on Gary B is is thought process on on more content. Of course, you need to uh, strategize that content. But the more content you put out there, of course, uh, telling a story, as Christine said, uh, the more reach uh, you can have. So therefore, uh, I, I will create a candidate persona inside. Um, my company to understand more or less where people tend to move and what type of social media and what they, they, they normally do. Uh, but uh, if, uh, for example, if you have 450 employees, 400 employees, pick 60 employees that will record a one minute video on why they love the company. You have already 60 days of content on why your company, you can upload it in Reels and Instagram. Then you pick, uh, I don't know, Gianluca or you pick an influencer out there that does the LinkedIn influencing and you do a LinkedIn influencing influencer ambassadors program. So you train your employees into becoming LinkedIn ambassadors. You teach them uh, for free and they post something about the company to two, three times a week, uh, being as uh, Christine said, super real, real and honest and so on. And um, because what I have seen from big companies is that the marketing team copy and paste is a, a copy and gives them to all the employees and they just repost that and it feels not that, personalized as Christine said before, so I do agree with that. So I will say uh, that understand what content you can do with the uh, low cost, uh, blogging, podcasting, interviews, I don't know, many, many ideas and, and throw them out there. Also, you can offer, to add before ending, also you can offer things for candidates. So for example, free mentorship on how to create a great CV to apply for my company, uh, for example, uh, and these things. Yeah. And you could also, on the final point, you could also be strategic as well with regards to if there's a particularly interesting or hard to fill role, you could offer candidates that are qualified for a role, how to fill in a CV. And it kind of gives a subtle signal that actually you're recruiting for this position. Um, so have a thing about what you could give back to the candidate community. Um, but I like the idea of kind of getting everyone to do like 60 second video to the camera um, about what it is about their job, what it is about that they like about the company, um, and then just making use of that material. Um, that's it. That, that's it. It's, right now. We 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 oh, shouldn't underestimate how powerful the cameras that we have. Um, uh, all of us are carrying around they're incredibly powerful devices, um, which you know every decade it kind of goes along. It, it expands the capability. Uh, to the level we wouldn't be able to consider is possible. Um, and of course, as we've seen through the success of the likes of TikTok and, and, and short form video, what have you, it isn't necessarily high quality footage that gets the, 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 the traction. Um, it's someone telling authentic stories. Um, I mean, there's a reason why TikTok is short, short form video, um, because it's about can this person say an authentic thing in a short period of time? Uh, and of course, uh, I think that's perfectly possible uh, to do. In fact, now that I think about it, um, the day in a life of type videos, uh, some of the most popular videos on the likes of Reels or, or, or TikTok, because uh, people are very interested uh, to know what's going on in that this or that business. Um, so um, 
as a, as a, a recruiter, a TA person, head of people, someone who's in charge of talent attraction, uh, think about a way in which you can encourage more people to do so, but do so in a, in a systematic way so that you can, can kind of collect and curate uh, some of that information and create some amazing assets um, that the company would, would want to use. Um, free to free to try. Go ahead, Gianluca. Yeah, I will add to that. Meanwhile, you are doing this. You need to keep your house in order. So at the same time, collect the data of, of your recruitment processes. And with that data structure, a good candidate feedback, a great information, good processes. So the candidates that are passing through the process within their candidate experience, as well as speak out of what's happening. So both things align your processes and how you do things and actually what you're saying out at the same time, because if not, one will fall, you're not giving feedback to anyone, Every, everything is burning here, and then you're telling a, a nice story. So I will say leveraging both things at the same time. No, that's really important. And um, but by the way, folks listen to this and think, oh my goodness, that's uh, more yet more work. Uh, well, guess what? This is good news, because whatever this tells you is that whatever plan you have needs to be uh, aligned to your capacity to do that work. Um, and it should actually push you uh, to get the employees to support on content creation rather than you inheriting it yourself. Uh, employer branding is not TA or marketing sitting there creating videos. Um, it's there trying to coordinate um, uh, the organization to talk about itself in such a way that it attracts people uh, 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 to, to want to work there. Um, okay, Christina, same question to you, really. Uh, any more ideas as to how we kind of get our brand out there? You know, we haven't got mega billions, but maybe we've got, you know, some interesting values or interesting kind of jobs to do or whatnot. Yeah, I mean, I've, everything we've talked about is so important. And, and it is about thinking about the stakeholders in the business. So, you know, when Imran's talking about the local community, absolutely. When John Lucas talking about, you know, using the people in your business, 100%. But do that kind of you know, look at the strategic partnerships you've got as well. If you are, you know, you're looking at a particular sector, you know, who are the influencers in in that sector? Because they've already got an audience. They are, you know, they maybe they've got a fantastic following on LinkedIn. Maybe they've got a podcast that loads of people listen to. And actually, you can build those relationships where you go and guest on that podcast. You contribute an article for that blog. And you get involved that way as well. But also get your people involved in that process. I have, um, you know, one of the people on my team now, Kim, she now goes and, you know, I do a lot of speaking at events, but I've now as part of our employer brand, I want to bring people in that are happy to jump on video, that are going to talk, you know, we're passionate about what we do. I want people in the team that are passionate about it. So I've looked for opportunities where, we grow the team and we get them out doing that stuff. It's not just me as the business leader. And I think that's really key. Look at all those stakeholders, look at the values, then actually how can we tick as many boxes at once as possible? How can we make it really easy for ourselves? I'm all about growing the team. So now I'm growing her. People are seeing the kind of person that works for this brand through audiences that are going to help us attract more people in. And I've done it all by keeping the rules really simple. And when we're trying to get people in the team to create content for us, if I say, okay, guys, come on, record me a video. It's like giving them a blank sheet of paper. Whereas if you go like, I love that. I love the story you told me about how you felt when you were prepping for an interview to come in here and then the conversation you had. Do you think you could have recorded a video of like, you know, how you told that story to me? It's like, it's not a blank sheet of paper anymore. They've got direction and we don't need to put a load of rules there. Right, really, really important point. Two important points there. Let me not forget them, uh, Christina. Um, uh, so uh, the, the, getting the message out there, local influencers, um, they don't have, to, it doesn't have to be, you know, Mr. Beast or anybody. Uh, it, it, it could well be, I don't know, the local mayor or something. It, it could be a local celebrity. It could be somebody who kind of has influence in that particular space. I'm talking geography for the time being, but think about domain as well. Uh, there's going to be a local hero that does something in that industry. Um, you know, is there a way in which you could align closely to that person? And are there projects you can support that person in doing? And perhaps you could get a favor back as a, as a return. 
Um, it's often useful to, I've always advocated doing like podcasts and stuff. Um, and one of the reasons is exactly that. You could kind of do brand association with some of these local heroes um, that may be part of a community that um, that you're, you, you, you need to recruit from. Uh, you know, I'm just thinking, for some reason, I'm thinking about cement. Uh, but let's imagine, uh, it's nothing I know, that I know nothing about cement industry, so forgive me anybody who's in that space. But let's imagine there's a local hero that knows loads about cement, uh, you know, or knows loads about the cement industry. And I want to do a podcast and just invite him on. Um, guess what? Yeah, someone might listen to that. Uh, you know, so if he if he is a person that's had success in that domain, presumably people that are following or interested in that career path would also be aware of him. Um, and my association brand wise connected with the, uh, this uh, influencer is is really going to support. Uh, so anyway, uh, that's a really good point. Uh, a second point I just want to underline, uh, Christine, you're asking people to produce content. You've got to be permissive, but you've also got to be guided. Uh, so in other words, you can't be, you know, giving people 20 page briefs. That's going to put everyone off, of course. Uh, give them a one, two line brief, but you can't be giving them blank slate either. Cause that's like, what do you want me to say, man? Um, ask them a question, have them answer the question. That's a classic one. Uh, whatever that question is. Um, okay, cool folks. We are like rapidly moving towards the end of this show. So we've already got like 50 minutes, less than 50 minutes left. Now is a good time for, for you uh, to ask any questions of our panel. Put it into the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. This is Zoom. You should be aware of it. If you're watching this on LinkedIn, just put it in the comment thread. We've got a team monitoring the comment thread there, and they're going to just populate questions that way. Um, and we'll get to those uh, in about 10 minutes' time when we get toward the final run of the show. Um, okay, so uh, we are now uh, expanding uh, the the brand presence. We're expanding the uh, uh, you know people are starting to get to know us. Maybe applicant flow rate is starting to tick up. Um, uh, sort of when can we expect this to happen? I mean, is there is it does it make sense to think like this? How do we measure the impact of our EB? Presumably we have to, because at some point someone's going to say, this is brilliant, man. But, you know, um, uh, what are the results? We need to be able to answer that question. Um, so how do we how do we create the the metrics so that we, we can report on uh, success or fail or some or some of these activities? Any thoughts on this? Um, uh, Gianluca, you definitely have some thoughts. So why don't we start with you? Yeah, good. Uh, I will start checking. If not, if I don't have an MPS, try to have a, a survey attached to any type of uh, of ATS that we have or, or, or in Google, if not. But try to have the data about how candidates are feeling through the process and, and what's the sentiment over a three, six month period of time. Uh, candidate quality, it means the churn rate reduced and the candidate quality is through the application processes, the offer acceptance rate. Uh, candidate demographics if we did a specific candidate persona in a specific locations to to understand how how it's going Gla glassdoor and kununu and all the competitors that could be out there to try to understand uh, how how the uh, the data is there and i, I will say as well the the application in, in talent as well the the application to offer rate instead of the sourcing one so try to understand how how it has has gone up or down or, or how it's going. Yeah, and let's not stress ourselves too much about like quantity or size of number. It's all it's all about how it uh, how the uh, uh, progress over time. You know, you're looking at has you know ha have we ticked up somewhat in some of these numbers that we want to tick up, or have we ticked down on the numbers that we want to tick down? Um, you know, for instance the. Uh, the dropout rate. Um, uh, we know what you know. Can we reduce the conversion on the dropout rate? Theoretically, if our EB is in the right place, uh, we should be attracting candidates that have kind of on alignment and have kind of self-selected themselves in. Um, it should mean that they're they're staying in process longer than uh, otherwise would be the case. Um, so, uh, what would be the key metric? If I mean, we talk about loads of metrics there, Jean Luca, but if there's one that you think is a good one to measure. Uh, the impact of EB, let's say, uh, uh, what would that be? <laughs> it's a difficult question, as I always believe that you cannot have just one North Star in this type of things. Um, Let me rephrase the question. Um, what would be the the one KPI you would definitely put in? 
And I'll ask uh, Christina and uh, Imran the other two questions, and hopefully we'll come up with three at the end. Maybe, maybe the the application to offer uh, rates. I would like to to see how how it goes, or the NPS results in general. But yes, application to to acceptance rate or yeah, rate. yeah, yeah. Okay, excellent. Um, how about you, Christina? Give us one metric you want to see in to measure the impact of VB. So I th I think um okay so I'm going to go external I I'd, I'd look at um social media engagement from the team um and potentially from potential candidates as well those that are in process so look okay. at how they're engaging from a social media perspective but you could also take that through into looking at your you know your email marketing engagement as well um and that piece of it if you are looking at creating communities for prospect employees, looking at how that's working as well for you. Okay, so let, let me understand you correctly here, Christina. You're saying that there's two measures on the external social media. Number one, the level of engagement we'll, our internal staff are getting when they're posting stuff because we've encouraged them to post stuff. We want to measure how they're doing with this. Um, you know, if they're just doing social distribution, pushing stuff out there, okay, great, but we, are they getting more engagement? Are they getting whatever? That's a number we care about on EB. Um, and the second side, you're talking about um, uh, sort of our, our people talking about our brand um, online. Um, uh, how do you monitor that, though? I mean, in that case, of just searching uh, for mentions or stuff. Is there is there a tool that monitors this? There's loads of tools out there. So things like uh, mention.net, stuff, stuff like that that you can do this with. However, it might be that you look at more of a campaign approach. So if you're know, using specific hashtags for a, an EB campaign that is running externally and looking at the engagement you're getting with that will we'll give you an idea. Yeah, very, very good. Um, OK, Imran, let's go to you. We talk about the one metric um, that you would put in uh, uh, to uh, uh, kind of... Uh, measure the impact of your EB initiative, what would that be? It would be uh, improvement percentage. That's the what would do. So as I mentioned, like, you know, because for my current, like, you know, the organization, what we do, we do survey twice a year, right? So that our first in KPI is that one, then what we did the last one and then current one, then we compare and I find out like, you know, what the percentage was a drop off or increase, whatever it is. Doesn't matter it's really what organization or the size, it's more of like, you know, the percentage wise. So if last one was 78% of people was positive of the working for your company, but it comes over the 68% this year, so 10% dropped significantly. And what exactly you did from an employer perspective to not to increase that, but it got dropped, it significantly dropped it. So that's one of the things is we always do that. And I think it's very important to uh, understand before you even you like in you know, a launch for another one because if you don't improve as the employer how are we going to Im improve your brand because obviously yeah. at the end of that you're taking in the feedback from those employees so and they're going to take the obviously the honest feedback they're going to provide it to you so this is one of the kpis i definitely have to have in your metrics to ensure that the how you can improve and the follow up yeah, absolutely. We, we, we need to uh, understand that all this exercise is, is a dialogue. It's a conversation we're having with the, the marketplace and also internally with our, with our business. Um, so uh, the ability to uh, kind of uh, uh, re respond and be agile to those things um, isn't a problem. We shouldn't be taking input, in other words, with a, a hostile attitude that we're trying to bat away uh, or neutralize, we should absorb that and say, look, great, here's an opportunity to have a conversation about it and then dive into that conversation. Uh, in fact, if we want to have, let's not forget, we don't have the time to cover it here, but let's not forget employer brand might also be a dynamic concept also. Um, your company might change. Um, and in fact, it might deliberately change. Uh, you know, you might decide, guys, this is great. We've been in this business for this, this, and this, but we're actually pivoting in this domain. And it basically means some of the the, the things that we uh, really valued about our business, they're going to change for us. Uh, so we need to actually revise who we're going to be going forward. That's kind of part of maturation. All human beings go through this reinvention. 
Um, so we, we, we need to understand that EB is not necessarily just a fixed start and stop project, uh, you know, park it, it's done, uh, cause different personalities will, will come in and change it irrespective of whether we want to or not. I mean, a sea level change, big C departmental head come in, does change things. It changes the culture. Um, so good time to do revisions. <laughs> Okay, cool. Uh, we're going to go to questions, folks. We've got loads of um, uh, 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 sort of areas that we've still to cover, uh, but we want to kind of deal with the questions as, as much as possible. Oh, we've only got one, which is okay. Um, but Ed's come in with, uh, with I think, a question that might um, uh, give us a bit of chew. Um, let's just tie, uh, answer this live. Um, what are the common obstacles um, organizations encounter when implementing EB measures? So what we're talking about here is, okay, we've got some great ideas, we're going to do the 60 minutes. Uh, you're going to do the 60 second video all round or something like this or whatever projects or initiatives that we have. But what what, what problems typically are we going to encounter in that situation? Um, and I guess, how do we do with those questions? But, but problems. Um, but the first one is what typical problems would you come, would you anticipate uh, from having an EB initiative? Christina, let's go you. So, yeah, I mean, I had to follow on from what you've just been talking about in terms of the essentially the commitment to, to EB. It's not a one off campaign that brings immediate results. You don't run an EB strategy for 12 weeks and then expect to see an uplift. It, it's it takes commitment. It requires consistency and it is something we've, we've got to be constantly testing new ideas, new ways of, of doing things looking at the results, tweaking them and going again. It, it's a, it's like I said, it's a road you're on already. So you've, you've really got to, to commit to it, listen to the signals that tell you, are you where you want to be or not? And make those changes with consistency and commitment. It, it's a long-term thing. Um, so definitely for me, that is, that's where I see people fall down. They'll, they'll put huge investment in. We're going to run this campaign where, um, we've got our hashtag we're going to use, we're going to spend £15,000 on LinkedIn ads for the next six months, and we expect all our problems to be solved. That's not what employer brand is. Yeah, it, it has to be sustained kind of uh, uh, un a communication as to who you are, essentially. You've got to find a way to, inter uh, to expose uh, your business um, uh, to... Uh, the audience that you're hoping to recruit from. Folks, we're running rapidly out of time. Let's just do one quick round, Robin. Uh, one bit of advice uh, to a solo recruiter who's listening to all of this, feeling really inspired, ready to roll. Um, but what's one bit of advice you guys would give to that person um, who, uh, you know, maybe is uh, starting to embark on some of these ideas? Uh, Jean-Luc, uh, you first. Yeah, uh, use AI. Yeah, leverage the usage of AI, such as uh, ChatGPT4. It's very good. Uh, and Zapier. Zapier is very powerful in automating processes, so you can save a lot of time doing the things that we have been doing. And it's pretty powerful. If you are solo, yeah. it's worth it. Yeah, so as a solo player, guess what? You've got an opportunity to think about all of these drones and AIs around you that's going to empower and take your ability to go forward. Okay, Imran, real quick, I give us one bit of advice to that audience, uh, to that uh, solo recruiter out there. So be passionate and do what you love. Absolutely. you got to commit to it, right? I mean, be uh, go in there with positive intent. Um, uh, Chris, Christina, final word to you, one bit of advice. you got about 30 seconds. Build it into your culture, listen for it, and evidence it. There we go. Um, folks, um, I have to leave it there. We have to leave it there. I hope you've enjoyed this conversation. Certainly I have. I do believe there's going to be a hard stop any moment, so I've got to rush this through. Thank you very much, Rosanna, Jean-Luca, Rosania, Imran Sharif, and Christine Robinson. Thank you, Tripad. Tripad Grow, by the way, are a, a new ATS that's designed for the solo recruiter, so make sure you check them out. If you're entering into your first in-house recruiter job, this may be a tool that you need to explore. Uh, if you're still resting with a spreadsheet or whatever it is, it is designed for that uh, one person running everything. Uh, check out Tripad Grow. Uh, okay, thanks a lot, everybody. Uh, thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.